Oh, hello, everybody. There's my hand. Welcome back to another episode of the Retro Hack Shack, and it's time for another edition of E-Waste Wednesday. We're going to be taking a look at this Toshiba satellite lap laptop from the early aughts. So looking at this laptop, three questions arise. Number one, why would you even want a laptop of a vintage like this, Toshiba laptop from the early aughts? Why would you want one of these? Number two, will it work? Um, it could have problems. I don't know. I haven't tested it yet. I haven't powered it on. So that's a good question. And the third question is, how much did it cost? Well, I'll be answering all of those questions coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. So why did I want to buy a laptop with Windows XP on it? Well, there's a number of reasons for that. Windows XP was the first version of Windows that didn't rely on DOS to be running underneath it. It was based on the NT kernel, and this forced a number of changes. One of them was that game developers would have to learn how to code within the constraints of XP. They added additional technology like DirectX and OpenGL was available for gamers to use, but it definitely marked a transition, sometimes a painful one if you've ever tried to run an old school DOS game on top of Windows XP, and it made it difficult to have a fun experience with those old games. However, it opened up new possibilities for new games, and so this is one of the reasons I like to have an XP machine around. I still remember being upset when I learned that there was no longer going to be DOS included with the next version of Windows. However, I quickly came to love Windows XP, and I still think it's one of the best operating systems that Microsoft ever put out. In fact, if you compare the user interface of Windows XP with, say, a modern Windows 10 system, the similarities are striking, and the way that people use the user interface hasn't really changed much over the years. Also, these systems are relatively cheap. You can find them easily. Uh, I'll show you my price at the end of the video, but they're still available. They still are fairly reliable. And so picking one of these machines up to play with is a no brainer. And because it's a laptop, it's small and compact. So if I wanna do something with an XP system, I don't have to keep a big desktop around, although I do anyway, uh, but I could just store this laptop and pull it out when I wanna run Windows XP. So that answers one question. Before I get into the other two, I want to take a second to thank the sponsor of this episode, PCBWay. If you've ever bought one of my RGB to HDMI boards from my website, then chances are it probably came from PCBWay. Why? Well, they offer low-cost PCB manufacturing, through-hole assembly, and they can source the parts I need for a reasonable price. So if you're looking for inexpensive PCB manufacturing, 3D printing, or CNC milling, check out PCB Way, and I thank them for their support of the Retro Hack Shack. So let's take a quick look at the outside of this laptop, and I'll point out some things that I saw that made me interested in picking this one up. First of all, if we look at the back, this is a Toshiba Satellite 1135-S155, um, and it also has an extra three on the end of the model number, which could be the third revision of this particular laptop and it requires a power supply that supplies 19 volts DC at 3.95 amps. So pretty heavy draw there. And unfortunately, this did not come with the power supply, but it's pretty standard, so I should be able to source a power supply easily. There's lots of other stickers on the back here, including some for Toshiba support, of course, the designed for Windows XP sticker, and it looks like some asset tags. And here's the intake for the exhaust fan on the bottom as well. On the front, there are some LED indicators for power and activity, as well as a DVD-ROM drive so I can play either CDs or DVDs in this thing. On the right side, there's a speaker, one of the stereo speakers, as well as some PCM CIA slots and a USB port. On the back, there's two more USB ports, an Ethernet port and a modem port. There's also a parallel port and VGA port for video out. There's the power input jack, and then there's some grills here for the fan exhaust to come out the back. Moving on to the left side, there's a security hole for a security cable, 
there's a Wi-Fi on and off switch. And here's what drew me to this initially was three discrete ports for audio inputs and outputs, as well as a discrete volume dial. These are things that have long since disappeared on modern laptops, but that I really appreciate, especially if I need to use this to capture audio or use a line in or a mic, just makes it a lot easier than having to use one of those breakout cables uh, to get this functionality. And then of course we have the left stereo speaker. The fact that this laptop has a standard 2.1 millimeter power jack is a huge plus for me because it means that I can use one of these variable power supplies and just match the voltage input needed for the laptop. So I want to plug this in and see if any of the LED indicators light up on the front panel. And sure enough, it looks like things are working okay so far. So this 20 year old battery still seems like it has some life in it yet. On the inside, the laptop has a fairly small but reasonable touchpad, which is located underneath the keyboard, which I notice is missing one key here, but maybe I can source another one in the future. And of course, it includes the requisite Intel and design for Windows XP stickers. Thanks to the Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine, we can take a look at this website from CompUSA back in April of 2003. Laptops at this time were starting to come down in price. It wasn't long before this that laptops would typically go for three, four, even five thousand dollars. But now the industry had started to refer to this particular style of laptop as notebooks, and the real price difference between other laptops at the time had to do with the type of processor it was running. So if you were running Intel Pentium 4 processor for a very similar Toshiba laptop, you'd have to pay two thousand dollars after rebate. But but if you were willing to settle for the Celeron processor that's included with this laptop, for example, you could cut that price down to $1,200 after rebate. Now, as I was doing research, unbelievably, I found that Best Buy actually still has a website, a live website up and running for this particular laptop. Just look how small that image is compared to what you would normally see. So somehow this particular laptop, this website for this laptop has survived for probably 20 years. And as you can imagine, this particular laptop is sold out. But I just find it hilarious that this laptop still exists. You can barely see uh, the images on a big screen like this, but they're there. And this is indeed the exact laptop that we're looking at today. I was also able to find another website from CNET where they had done a review. Luckily, CNET does put a lot of their old content available without the pictures up if you want to read old articles. So they're pretty easy to find. And this one popped right up in my searches. And this is from July of 2003. And you can see the price had dipped a little bit. Uh, it says that it's less than $1,100 now. And they're able to compare it to a few other laptops and do some benchmarks. So you can see here that actually it does really well compared to a Dell Inspiron or, or Inspiron. I'm never quite sure how to say that. Um, 1100 and an HP Pavilion ZE 4200, two very similarly equipped systems. They also provided a benchmark for the battery life. So this actually gives me something to test in the future to see exactly how long this thing will run on a full charge. In their test, this laptop lasted for 183 minutes before the battery gave out. So now it's time to answer the second question and see if this laptop still works. So let's hit the power button, cross our fingers. There we go. There's the BIOS. That's looking really good. No problems there. I guess the battery hasn't given up the ghost yet. And there's Windows XP Ultimate loaded. And here we go with Windows XP Ultimate Edition by Johnny. Luckily, the administrator password for this system was left blank. So that helps. Now that we're into the system, of course, we get a pop up saying the computer might be at risk. It goes without saying that I won't be doing any direct browsing on this laptop without making sure it's behind a pretty safe firewall. Now, at this point, I noticed that there was something wrong with the screen and I thought it was maybe some sort of rubber seal or something at first, but it's actually in the display itself or part of the way the graphics are coming out of the display. So I also might look if I ever find one of these laptops, look to replace this display in the future. The keyboard's very comfortable to type on. As you can expect, this laptop has the low profile keys with the spring driven mechanism that was common of laptops at this time. However, I noticed that the trackpad wasn't working. 
Looking at the function keys up top, I noticed that there was a bunch of functions that you could enable and disable, and one of them was for the trackpad. So I thought I'd try this, and sure enough, that enabled the trackpad no problem. Another issue I noticed was with the backslash key. Whenever backslash was pressed or displayed on the screen, it typed out this weird W looking character. So I figured, but perhaps since there was some Korean asset tags on the back, perhaps this was set up for Korean language input. And sure enough, when I went into regional and language options, Korean had been installed as one of the input languages. However, the default language was still US English, but I found under the advanced tab that for non-Unicode programs, Korean was set to handle those codes. And this is what was causing that backslash key to behave the way it was. Setting this back to US English fixed the problem from here on out. Now it was time to transfer some files and perhaps play some games. Easiest way to do this was to go ahead and connect the laptop to my local area network. Now luckily XP is a lot more user friendly when it comes to connecting things to networks. None of the fussing around like you used to have to do with Windows 98 and Windows 95. As a 2003 laptop, this should be able to run most games that came out in 2000, 2001, and even 2002. So I decided to try to run Medal of Honor Allied Assault. Now, I acquired this game in 2003, actually in Singapore at a CD shop uh, for, let's just say, a discounted price. And I still have the CDs to this day. Now, when I tried to run Medal of Honor, unfortunately, it didn't work. It just tested the graphics and then threw up this error message about OpenGL not wanting to load. Unfortunately, this error was all too common back in the day. One of the things that I remember you could do to fix this was update your graphics drivers. So I went on a hunt. Now, it can be difficult finding drivers for these integrated chipsets around this era. So let me share with you what I do and maybe it'll help you out if you find yourself in the same situation. If you look for the exact chipset that your particular model of laptop or desktop uses and you search on that, it can be a lot easier to find the drivers that you need. In this case, I noticed under graphics and video on the user guide that it said it was running an Intel 852GM. That's the chipset that this particular integrated chip uses. Searching for that instead of using the laptop model number yields much better results. In fact, you may find drivers for that chipset from other manufacturers that are still available and still work for your system. In this case, I found two drivers, one from Toshiba and another one from IBM for their ThinkPad series that was running this same chipset. So I first tried installing the Toshiba drivers. After all, they were the ones who made this laptop, right? But unfortunately, that didn't work. So after messing around with some of the driver settings and display settings, I decided to try the IBM drivers, which were released much more recently. And those drivers seem to do the trick. Look, it's working. Oh, let's turn the sound up a little bit. Ooh, the sound is good on this. You have been assigned to a mission few would qualify for. A mission few would survive. So I remember the opening sequence of this uh, game just being crazy cool. This was all really kind of popular back then with Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers and then the, this uh, game here. And uh, anyway, they're just going to go on and on. We can escape this, but they're just this, the opening sequence and the cutscene here introducing the game was so, so cool. Here we are. It looks like it's running. Uh, let me go get a mouse and we can play just a couple seconds of this and just test out, make sure everything's functioning. Okay, well, here's the first mouse I could lay my hands on. It's this weird mouse I was thinking about doing an episode on, but it's got the actual water down here in the bottom and some kind of logo or something floating around that's come off in the intervening years. Uh, but I'm going to give this little mouse a try, see if it'll work. I've got you covered.
Well, anyway, I have no problem whatsoever running this game on this uh, uh, hardware, the Celeron processor, the amount of memory I have. It all runs really just fine. Of course, it's clunky compared to today's games, but uh, no problem running this at all. Okay, so some of you out there may be asking, what about DOS games? Well, I didn't buy this laptop to play DOS games. So there is, of course, DOS emulation. You can pull up, uh, you know, a DOS prompt and, and do things in, in DOS, but it's kind of emulated. If you want to play DOS games, you can actually run DOSBox, which should run fine on top, and it's going to emulate a lot of the things that you would expect to see in um, DOS, and it, especially it'll help with sound drivers. But you can play... DOS games natively on Windows XP, they're just really fussy because, especially with sound, you might not work. You may have performance problems. Uh, I remember doing things in the old days where we'd have to copy the autoconfig.nt and the config.nt files over and then change those and point. You know, you'd have to do all this funny business, basically, to try to get DOS games to run. So it's not the best platform for that. So I went ahead and installed Dark Forces on this laptop, and we can try to run it. And I don't expect to get any sound, but we may be pleasantly surprised because Windows XP does emulate, in most cases, um, a Sound Blaster with kind of like the default addresses and, and so forth. So sometimes these programs will just work, but let's just go ahead and try it and see if it'll work in Windows XP. There we go, took a little bit, but it loaded up pretty quickly. And yeah, I should be hearing sound here. If I remember this game, this is a pretty cool game. It was essentially built off of Doom um, or the id engine. Uh, so it, it plays a lot like Doom or Quake, but it's actually Star Wars theme. Uh, pretty cool. I don't know if anybody remembers playing this at the time, but it was pretty cool. Pretty cool game for DOS back in the day. Let's go ahead and see if we can skip this. Okay, so there's no sound, there's no music or, or I'm assuming no sound effects either. Let's go ahead and exit this. There is a utility that can help with some of the sound problems, and it's pretty good. And it's this one here called VDM Sound. You can look this up, VDM Sound. You should be able to download it. You install that on the system. So one thing that VDM Sound gives you is the ability to right-click on an executable and run it with VDMS, which is really, really neat. Um, it will emulate some sound, and you can change all the settings. In fact, let me just show you some of the capabilities. Uh, and it also creates a shortcut over here, so you can just launch the game with uh, the shortcut, and it'll it'll always uh, use VDM sound uh, to do it. So if we, if we just go over here and just do uh, properties, you can see all of the various options that this actually lets you do. It lets you turn on expanded memory, for example, uh, Visa support, CD-ROM support, general MIDI. I have it set for Roland MT32 MIDI. We'll see how that sounds. Probably not quite as good as a real Roland MT32. I don't think this lets you uh, load different um, sound fonts and things like that to make the sounds sound better. Uh, but there's a lot you can do. And in fact, there's even an advanced mode where you can go in and set even more settings. So yeah, really cool program. And hopefully that'll give us some sound. Here's the ad lib support you can turn on with the uh, port address, etc. Same thing with Sound Blaster. You can set the base port, IRQ, DMA, all of those things in here to try to get your DOS program to work under Windows XP. Uh, and this, I think this will also work under Windows 2000, but not um, NT or or like Windows 7, things like that. At least that's, that's what I think. Correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Here we go. And you can see up here now it loaded the VDM sound. Whoops, it went by quick. Oh, there we go. We got sound. So that went by really quick, but it did say up at the top it was loading the uh, VDM sound file before it loaded the, the game. And I know I got sound. Let me turn this up. There we go. Uh, hopefully this doesn't get me a content match because this is some pretty uh, crappy, you know, kind of MIDI emulation here of the of the file. So I'm going to turn that down just so I don't get content match. But um, yeah, it is working. The sound is absolutely working. Let's make sure the sound effects work. I'll skip over this and we can start the mission. Here we go. Okay. 
loading the mission, and here we go. So you can see, if you haven't played this before, you can see it's uh, very much like Doom. And I've got to reach way over here to get to the controls so I can move around. And there's some dudes in here. I thought there was another one. I don't see him. But yeah, if you haven't played this before, I highly recommend that you check it out. There he is. There we go. Get some shields. And uh, yeah, it plays uh, plays really well. Ooh, ooh, I got a better gun. Look at that. I thought there was more guys in here. Oh yeah, there we go. Got him. Yeah. So I'm not going to go through this too much. I just wanted to show you that utility in case you do want to run DOS games um, on top of Windows XP and you're having trouble getting sound, that program, uh, VDM Sound, might actually help you out and enable you to have uh, sound effects and music in your games. So someone in the comments uh, on one of my previous episodes where I talked about the um, Gateway Astro and the Gateway Profile, you know, why there was no music in Doom, for example, and this is kind of why. So this program would probably help with that if you were trying to run some of these old games and get music and sound. So that's kind of a follow-up to that question as well. Highly recommend this little application, which you can find all over the internet. So there we go. It's a Toshiba satellite uh, back from 2003, completely working, games run fine, and yeah, everything's basically running. I will be on the lookout for another one of these. Uh, could be in worse condition or whatever, as long as that key, that key for the up arrow key is there. I'll need to replace that, so I'll be on the lookout for another one just for that purpose. Uh, but I'm super excited that this is all working. At some point, I could go in, I guess, and replace the display to get rid of this line, but it's not a big deal. I would still pull this out and use it. It's a good quality laptop, and it seems to be working great. Now, that third question that I mentioned, or I don't know what order it was in, but the question about how much did this cost? Well, I got this at a... Uh, it's not a dedicated e-waste place. It's actually just a recycling center, and they deal mostly in bottles and can recycling, and you get a, a fee for bringing those in. They weigh it. You get a fee. You can get a little bit of money that way. But uh, so it smells really bad, by the way. The, the place when you go there just smells like old beer, stale beer and wine. But they also do collect e-waste there. And they're nice enough to let me look through some of their things. And I was able to find this. And so the price that I paid for this Toshiba laptop was $15, just $15 for this. Well worth it, I think. I'll add this to my collection. Doesn't take up too much room, so I can just put it on a shelf with some other ones and, and have a range of laptops that I might want to use for gaming or just to load up Windows XP, in this case, Ultimate Edition by Johnny, uh, to try something out or test some software or what have you. So I'm really happy with it. And before I say goodbye, I just want to thank all of my patrons that support the channel. Really appreciate them. And you can find their names in the credits in just a second. So until next time, thanks for watching. Patrons receive ad-free and early access to content after the episode commentary, and of course, your name in the credits. If you liked that episode, here's a few more you might enjoy, and I thank you for your support. End of line.